like to say welcome. We want to thank God for you all logging in. You've logged in to Strong Tower Apostolic Ministries Incorporated, where we say welcome. We, we are, are expecting our great God to do great things for us. Great power and great grace. Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. We know you could have been to millions of other sites. We're humbled and grateful that you chose Strong Tower Apostolic Ministry. And we hope and pray that God will give us a word on tonight that will bless you, that will encourage you, that will strengthen you, that will motivate you, and that will help you to keep on fighting the good fight of faith. Please, please, please don't give up. Keep on holding to God's unchanging hand. Amen? He's a good God. He's a merciful God. He's a prayer answering God. And we hope and pray that God will give us a word in Bible class on tonight that will bless you. Uh, tonight is Wednesday. February 4th, 2015, and we're having our Bible class, and last week I started on uh, Genesis chapter 38, and I didn't finish. We made it up to about verse 12 or 14, somewhere right in there, and that's where we're going to pick it up today. Uh, we hope and pray that uh, you will be blessed in this. We know that there are family secrets in every family just about out there. I don't know of any family that don't have any secrets. So that is what we're coming from tonight, Family Secrets Part 2. We're going to finish up Genesis chapter 38. And if we know, when I say secrets, I'm talking about things that are shameful to talk about. There are some things that may have happened to you and your family that uh, only you and God knows. And uh, this is something that happened to Joseph and his family and the repercussions from treating each other wrong. Family members shouldn't be treating each other wrong. We, we should be loving one another and helping one another and encouraging one another. But we know that sin can occur within the family. And when sin occurs in the family and family members do each other wrong, that's what we call family secrets. When we do things to one another within a family and we don't want anybody else to know about it, we call it a family secret. And we try to cover it up because it's shameful a lot of times. A lot of times we don't want people to know our business is what we say. But when we look at the Word of God, it's covered just about everything that can happen to somebody it's happened in the Word of God. And those are some areas that need to be covered. Sometimes they're very sensitive areas and, and very painful areas. In some instances, it may have caused some mental illness in people and, and hurt. So if you're hurting out there, there is help. Sometimes it helps to talk about it to somebody, to let somebody know. But here we're looking at uh, some things that happen in the line of Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, in his family line. And he revealed it for us not for purposes of gossiping and talking about one another, but for healing purposes. To know that there are things that happens within our families that we need to be delivered from. And we need to forgive each other for those things. So I hope and pray that God will bless us. Let's pray right now because this is such a sensitive topic that I want to be careful and pray it up that God will bless us to, to handle this delicately. Precious Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray according to your will right now. This is a delicate topic, oh God. Some people are truly hurting from things that family members have done to them. Lord, we ask for healing within their hearts, healing within their spirits, healing, oh God, within their family. Help them to forgive one another and to stop doing those things that are shameful and hurtful to one another. But families should love each other and help each other and stick together. So Father, we pray your blessings on this word on tonight. Bless us with the word that, first of all, that will please you and that will encourage your people. Grant thy servant the grace to speak thy word by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, without any further ado, we'll get into our Wednesday night Bible class, Family Secrets, Part 2. Genesis chapter 38, verse 17, 15, or 12, 12. Let's get back into the word. Genesis chapter 38, and we start at verse 12. It says, And in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, it didn't tell what Judah's wife's name was, it just says the daughter of Shua, his father in law. She died, and Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shears to Timnath, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. Now let's click on comforted. Let's see what that means. 
What does it mean to comfort? Because when someone loses a, a, a wife or a spouse or a child, that's a painful, painful experience. And it says he was comforted. It comes from the Hebrew word nakam. To be sorry, console oneself, repent, regret, comfort, be comforted. To be sorry, to be moved with pity, have compassion. To be sorry, root, suffer grief. And it says to repent. Now, does Judah have anything to repent over? What has Judah done to his little brother, Joseph? Sold him into slavery. Now, it looks like he's reaping some very, very harsh things because he's living a lie. They told their dad that he had been torn by a beast and killed, knowing they had sold him into slavery. They haven't confessed their sin yet. So it says the way of a transgressor is hard. When we live with unconfessed sin, God not only punishes us for that sin, but then we go through things. Look at what he's going through. Our family members suffer. His wife passes. His two sons die. And now some other grief is about to occur. Now it says to comfort oneself, ease oneself, console, to be sorry, have compassion, rue, repent, comfort oneself, be comforted, to ease oneself. But it didn't say that he confessed his sin, did it? Not anywhere did it say he went to his dad and said, Dad, I'm sorry for selling our little brother into slavery. He's still living with that sin at this time, isn't he? See, there are family secrets. Sometimes we do things to each other that we're ashamed to admit. And he's ashamed to admit it. He's ashamed. Go back. Yeah, he's ashamed to admit what he's done to his little brother. But he's reaping some harsh, harsh punishment, isn't he? When you have to bury two of your children and your wife too, that's harsh. That's serious, isn't it? I hope and pray that I never have to experience that, to bury none of my children or my spouse. I don't want to experience that. I love all my children, and I hate, hate the even thought of it. But this man is going through this, but he still hasn't repented or confessed his sin, has he? It says, verse 13, And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. Now, Tamar is also a casualty. She has lost two husbands. She is married to two of them. Judah's sons, and both of them died. And then he promised her his third son. He only had three, but he was too young to be married at the time. So he's told her to go home to your father's house and wait until he grows up. Then I'll give him to you. But he changed his mind, didn't he? He basically lied to her because he was not going to give her another son of his. So here's a lie he's dealing with. Now look what happens now. His wife dies and now he goes up. And she put on widow's garments off. In other words, the black robe or whatever it was their tradition was, she took it off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was wrong and she was not given unto him to wife. Now, Tamar is, she, she's desperate for a child. She wants a baby. Because I told you all that in those days, that was their retirement plan. Your children were your retirement plan. And when you didn't have a child, when you didn't have a child, who's going to take care of you in your old age? They didn't have nursing homes. Not that I know of. If they do, you all call me and let me know. They didn't have welfare. If they did, let me know. They didn't have food stamps. They didn't have anything to secure you after you got to be a certain age. They didn't have a retirement plan. So your children, you raise them up, and in your old age, they take care of you. That was their policy. That was their retirement plan. But today we have nursing homes, don't we? Today we have uh, 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 homes for the elderly. But it really is the children's responsibility to take care of their parents in their old age because the parent took care of you all, didn't they? They took care of their children. So she had no children. So she's desperate for a child. 
And so she does something in desperation, doesn't she? She pretends to be a prostitute. And him losing his wife leaves him in a vulnerable situation. He's hurting, he's grieving, and he wants some comfort. Now, nothing justifies sin. It's not justified. But remember, the Ten Commandments have not been written yet. Moses has not been born. There are no commandments for them to be following except for the commandment of the conscience. I think they call this is the conscience age in the dispensation of, of the of the dispensation of the conscience. So they did everything their conscience allowed them to do. But there was no laws. There was no thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that. Moses hadn't been born. The Ten Commandments were written. So there's a lot of things they did according to their conscience. And you know we can sever our conscience and do some pretty heinous things sometimes. And this is what she did. Let's continue the story. She says, she's pretending to be a prostitute. And uh, she sees that Sheila was grown up. And she was, she was not given unto him to wife. So she's upset about that. So, and when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a harlot. He thought her to be a harlot because she had covered her face. Obviously, we know what a prostitute looks like in our day, don't we? They're pretty skimpily dressed. They usually wear short shorts or mini skirts, a lot of makeup. They don't have to, but that's usually the telltale symbol, the way they dress, right? That's why we teach our women in Pentecost to be holy. We don't want you going around looking like a prostitute. People judge you according to how you dress. Did you know that? And he looks at her according to the way she's dressed and thinks her to be a harlot. So when we see women dressed in short shorts and mini skirts and everything hanging and showing, you could be mistaken for a prostitute. Click on harlot. That's why we try to teach our women, don't, don't dress like that. Don't, don't carry yourself like that. That's misleading. If you're not a prostitute and you're dressing like a prostitute, someone we may think you're a prostitute. It's not because we're mean and we don't want you to show your stuff, but you show your stuff to your husband. Don't show your stuff to strangers. When strangers see your stuff, they think you got it for sale. You're showing your goods. Hey, I'm advertising. Look at what I got for sale. Comes from the Greek Hebrew word Zena. Strong's H2181. Zana. 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 And it means to commit fornication, to be a harlot, play the harlot, act like a harlot, commit fornication. There it is. Commit adultery. Of course, he was an adulterer because his wife had died, right? But he was still fornicating. That's what prostitutes do. They sell their body into fornication. It says to be a cult prostitute, there were some uh, prostitutes who worked for their, their idols. They sold their bodies to raise money and funds for their, I don't want to say church, but it was their idols, their temples. <laughs> we don't want that in our church, do we? The Lord don't want his, his daughters selling their bodies trying to raise fundraisers for the church. That's just the opposite of what he teaches, isn't it? So we certainly don't want to call it a church. To be unfaithful to God, to play the harlot, to commit adultery, to be forced into prostitution, and to commit fornication. So some people permit, force their uh, women into prostitution. They call it white slavery today. That's why you have to protect your women, because women are being kidnapped, being hooked on drugs, and forced into prostitution to support their drug habit. There are some evil things occurring in our country. 2015, and this is still happening. That's a shame, isn't it? 2015, and it's still happening. But she did this on her own. And she knew how to play the harlot just by changing the way she was dressed. So young women out there, it matters how you're dressed. It gives a signal to men. For sale, or for free, I'm easy. <laughs> but then when well, we got all this date rape and all this stuff going on, I mean, somebody needs to be preaching and teaching on this, don't you think? 
Football players don't drug up women's drinks. Women don't go into to, to dorms and get drunk and drink everything they give you. There's evil that's happening in our society right under our noses because we don't teach and talk about it. But we're gonna to have to learn to talk about these family secrets. These are some things that happens within the family and out of the family. Now here's his daughter-in-law acting like a prostitute. Why? Because he didn't hold up to his promise. He held it up the second time and he wasn't gonna do it a third time. Watch what happens. And he turned unto her by the way and said, go to I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what wilt thou give me that thou mayest come in unto me? See, that's the way a prostitute talks. How much? How much you gonna give me? For what? If I let you do what you're gonna do. How much? She talked like a prostitute. You say, oh, honey, you talk like you know, know what you're talking about. Well, I've never been to a prostitute, but I've, I've watched TV shows, and TV shows are pretty accurate, aren't they, <laughs> about some things. So just be careful, young ladies, how you talk to men, because they can read what you say in a different way. And if you're not a prostitute, don't behave like one, right? Don't talk like one. Don't give that message, because the way you, tr you carry yourself is the way people will treat you. If you carry yourself like a prostitute, they'll treat you like a prostitute. If you carry yourself with respect, they'll treat you with respect. If you carry yourself like you love yourself, they'll treat you like you love yourself. Does that make sense? Verse 17. And he said, I will get, send thee a kid from the flock. He said, I'm going to paint you with a little baby goat or a little baby sheep, whatever it is, whatever a kid represents. See, click on kid. I think that's a little baby goat. And call it a kid. She wanted a real kid, though, didn't she? What we call She wanted a baby. She didn't want a goat. She wanted a baby. And she was desperate for a baby. But she didn't want just anybody's baby. She wanted to be in the family of Judah. That was who she was married to. A's. Strong's Acts 5795. A's. A's. And it means a female goat, a she goat, a goat, or a kid. That's why they say don't call children kids because a kid is another word for a goat. <laughs> when you call a child a kid, you're calling them a goat and didn't even know it. But that's what a kid represents. Not a human child, but an a animal, a goat. Children are called children. Baby sheep and baby goats are called kids. Did y'all know that? But well, we call our own children kids sometimes just out of force of habit. Okay, verse 18. And he said, what pledge shall I give thee? And she said, thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thy hand. In other words, give me something until I get that kid. Let me hold something. A signet is what you, they use to sign something with, a bracelet that they're wearing. You know what a bracelet is, but click on signet. It's kind of like a signature. <laughs> we sign our name today like we sign in our checks. We sign something, that's our signet. Strong's H, 2368. Hothom, 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 and it means a seal a signet or a signet ring. Uh, people that couldn't write, they had a ring that they would use instead of their signature back then. And they would seal it, and that was their seal that represented their signature, what we say today. So she got his signature, she got his bracelets, and she got his staff. Well, a staff is what a shepherd uses. Remember, they were, they were herders to, to control his sheep. Remember, he was going to see his sheep. And he saw her by the wayside and thought, well, I thought, think I have a little fun before I get the sheep, right? Click on staff. Look how God's people can act. These are God's chosen people, remember? But there are people just like you and me. They commit sin. They commit fornication. They commit adultery. They commit murder. They sell their little brothers into slavery. They do just as much evil as we do. 
but they repent. God forgives you when you repent. All right, it comes from the Hebrew word. Genesis 8, 42, 94. Mantan. Mantan. Mantan, it means a staff, a branch, a tribe, a rod, a branch of a vine, uh, a tribe, the tribe of Judah, company led by a chief with the staff originally. So it was his rod that he carried in his hand that represented his tribe, the tribe of Judah. So she had a lot of important stuff, didn't she? And if you, and everybody knows who this stuff belongs to. When you sign your name on a check, they know that's your signature because they compare it to your driver's license and other signatures that you've made. Yep, that's your signature. You did it. So she was wise in that, wasn't she? How I know you're going to give me a kid. Leave me this stuff until I get it. This is what she said. And he gave it to her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. Now that's a family secret, isn't it? A father being with his daughter-in-law and having a baby. That's like my son getting a wife and me going in and being with his, his wife. That's a family secret, isn't it? That's a shameful thing, isn't it? But this is exactly what happened. But her husbands had what? They had died. So she was desperate for a baby. So that's why she did what she did. That was her motivation. But she didn't want just anybody's baby, right? She was in the tribe of Judah. Now, verse 19. And she arose and went away and laid by her veil from her. In other words, she put the prostitution clothes away. From her and put on the garments of widowhood again. See? She dressed like a widow again. You know what a widow is? Someone who's grieving. Click on widowhood. When a woman has lost her husband, back in those days in their custom, they dressed to show that they were a widow. See, the way you dress women and men, it represents something. That's why in Pentecost, we teach holiness. Dress like a holy young woman. Dress like a holy young man. You represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The way you dress gives people a message. Oh, they love the Lord. They're holy people. They love God. They're not trying to sell their bodies. They're not trying to advertise their body. They want to wait till they're married. They got a standard about them. They got something that they're living for. What you, the way you dress represents what people think of you. Whether you realize or not, if a policeman walked through that door, how would we know he was a policeman? You see a gun on his side, you see a uniform he's wearing, unless he was a detective. Now, I said a policeman. I didn't say a detective, did I? I said a policeman. Not an undercover policeman, not a detective, but a policeman. They wear uniforms. The dress tells you something. Now, Al Manuth. Al Manuth. You got from page 491. Al Manuth. And it says widowhood, a widow. Come on down. Uh, use of a condition of Israel living in exile. Okay, so they she dressed in widowhood, kind of like wearing all black, as we would say. Now let's go back and finish it up because I'm running out of time. But all of this is transpiring because Judah's living with a secret, isn't he? What's his secret? I sold my little brother into slavery, and I have not confessed. But God, still, God knows what happens, doesn't he? He knew what happened. So now he's being punished. And Judah sent the kid. See, he held his word. I got to get my ring back. I got to get my bracelets back. I got to get my rod back. So he sent a kid by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he found her not. <laughs> she got a scheme, though. She got a plan. Because do you know they could kill her? If she's waiting for him to give him another son, and she goes and gets pregnant by another man, they have the right to burn her to death, to kill her. And he was the one wrong. Watch what it says. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot? Don't even call her by name. Didn't even know her name. She's just a harlot. Where is that prostitute? 
that was openly by the wayside. And they said, there was no harlot in this place. There was no prostitute in this place. She was very sneaky, wasn't she? They didn't even know about her. She covered up family secrets. Verse 22, and he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said, there was never or no, no harlot in this place. There was no harlot. They call it H-O today, right? I'm not going to say that word, but that's what they call it today. It means, so daughters, never call yourself that. You are a woman of God. Amen. You are a virtuous woman. That's what I'm training you all to be. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Men won't look at you like a harlot. Men won't look at you like a prostitute because you've been trained better. You've been taught better. And you won't stoop to that level, right? Verse 23, and Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Now look at it, he worried about being ashamed. Now she got my stuff. Oh my gosh, she got my signet ring, she got my rod, she got my, my bracelets. Boy, if we don't find her, I'm going to be embarrassed. He's caring about shame now, isn't he? Family secret. I don't want that out. I don't want nobody knowing I've been with a prostitute. I don't want nobody knowing I've been with a harlot. She got my stuff. We don't find her. I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. Verse 24, and it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah sent Tamar. My daughter-in-law had played the harlot. <laughs> That's who it was. She played a prostitute. And also, she is with child by horror. They were right, weren't they? They told the truth. She did play a harlot. She did commit whoredom. Click on whoredom. What does that mean? Get a full understanding because I've been a teacher for 20 years, and I hear girls calling themselves pimps, and HOs and all this kind of stuff because the music puts it in them. We've got to teach our daughters better than that. You're not this. You're better than that. You're a child of God. You're a woman of God. You're a princess. Your daddy's a king. He's a king of kings and the Lord of lords. You're a princess, daughter. Zenu. Strong's page 2183. Zenu. Zenu. And it means adultery, fornication, prostitution. Every one of those is a negative word, isn't it? She played the prostitute because she got paid for it, didn't she? Paid a little kid, a goat, not a baby, but she wanted a real baby out of it. And she got it, didn't she? And Judah said, bring her forth and let her be what? Burnt! That's cruel, isn't it? Look at what he's done. You sold your little brother into slavery. You committed, you, you went into a harlot, and now you want to burn her up. See, that's the thing about a hypocrite, y'all. A hypocrite will do things and tell you not to do it, and they doing it. Now, he want to burn her up. Oh, how cruel. That's what a, that's what a hypocrite does. You understand? They do the same thing, but they want to punish you and put your business out when they don't, they've done the same thing. But we need to repent and forgive one another. We've all committed sin. We've all fallen short. We've all fell short of God's glory. So repent and be merciful unto one another and help somebody up. Verse 25, but look at how wise she was. When she brought, was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law sin. By the man whose these are, am I with child? And said, she said, discern, I pray thee, whose the signet, bracelet, and staff. He couldn't run anymore. That's mine. That's my signet. That's my bracelet. That's my staff. My name all over it. I can't run from it. Now look at what he does. Now he's ready to, ready to repent. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she had been more righteous than I because I gave her not Sheila, my son. And he knew her again no more, meaning he never did go be with her intimate anymore. But they didn't burn her up. They didn't burn her children up. 
his grandchildren were his children, in other words. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins were in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound up his hand, and the scarlet thread, uh, hand, a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. But even that was deceptive, wasn't it? Watch what happened. And it came to pass as he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out. <laughs> and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez. What does Perez stand for? Over a minute. Just about that. What is Perez? Strong's H, 6557. Perez. Perez. And it means Perez or, or breach. Twin son of Zerah and Judah by Tamar and ancestors of the family of Judah, the Hezronites, the Hulamites, Hamalites. From the Hezronites came the royal line of David and Christ. This is, he was the father. He was a forerunner of King David, who was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. And his brother's name was Zerah. Now that's a family secret, isn't it? That's something you want to want to cover up and not tell anybody. But God put it in the Word. Why do you think God put it in the Word? Because we all have secrets. We all have we all have sinned and fallen short of God's grace, glory. I mean, we all have sinned. Zero. Just not just age twenty-two, twenty-six. Is that a man? Is that a man? And it means rising, a son of Reuel, grandson of Esau, twin brother of Perez of Judah, the Tamar descendants, and so on and so forth. Now let's go back to Matthew. I did this last week and showed you that they didn't deny it in the New Testament, did they? They didn't deny it. They put it in here, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judas, or Judah, and his brethren. And Judah begot Pharez and Zerah of Tamar, and Pharez begot Ezra, and Ezra begot Aram. But you see, she is in the family. That's a family secret, isn't it? That's a shameful thing that happened. But God didn't try to cover it up, did he? See, the, the Bible tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Even when the truth is shameful, you can count on God to tell the whole truth. That's why I love his word, because he didn't try to cover up things like we do. And I know that some of us have things in our family that only God should know about. But those things leave scars in people's hearts. So if you're hurting out there and you need somebody to talk to, tell God about it. Amen? Or talk to a psychologist or a Christian psychiatrist and let them know how you're hurting, what's going on on the inside. Because we all have sin and fallen short of God's glory. So I'm going to pray right now. We're going to pray all over for those who are hurting out there through family secrets. Precious Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray according to your will for your people all over. Hurting people, people hurting people, hurting people hurting other people. Oh God, we ask that you would deliver us from the pain, deliver us from the heartache, deliver us from the suffering inflicted on us by our loved ones. Some of us have been hurt by brothers, hurt by sisters, hurt by fathers, hurt by parents. Oh God, let it stop. Have mercy on your people everywhere. Give them a mind to repent, O oh God, and deliver them by your grace and your mercy. We cast it all in your hands right now. We are expecting our great God to do great things for us. And Lord, it's a great thing to deliver somebody from pain, a great thing to deliver somebody from shame, a great thing to deliver somebody from heartache, and giving them a sound mind to forgive. We pray according to your will right now, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. And I want to thank you all for logging in. We know you could have logged into millions of other sites, 
but we hope and pray that something has been said on tonight that will help you in the healing process. We know that these things are shameful and it's painful, but God is able to heal you. God is able to restore you. God is able to bless you and bless your mind. Just confess it and forsake it, and he's able. Amen? Thank you for logging in. God bless you.